Right, please take your seats. Thank you. Right. Hey, let's go. Okay. No, we are not live. All right. Good evening, everyone, whoever is joining us from this auditorium in the ISU Tagush Park Central Campus. Welcome. <laughs> Perfect. And greetings to everyone who are watching us online, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as we always say. So today is the ISU, SSB, International Space University Space Studies Program, Distinguished Lecture Series number 10. So we are on the fifth week of the program, and we have uh, already webcasted nine of these events, and today is no exception. So far, we have uh, talked about lots of things. Uh, of course, uh, you know, very recent events, the images from James Webb Space Telescope. We talk about uh, Moon. We talk about the you know just a couple of days ago it was the the Moon Day, and then we talk about Mars. We talk about you know how to land on Mars, and then today we are taking a step beyond you know what is beyond Mars. You know when we talk, we are talking about human spaceflight, what will happen when we are beyond Mars? What will happen to uh, the future of human spaceflight? So very exciting stuff. So, for this very interesting talk, we have a special guest and a very good friend of ISU. Uh, Sony White is with us. So, very, very briefly, uh, Sony uh, has a uh, vast experience, but before that, he actually has a, a, B, a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science of Mechanical Engineering and then a PhD on Physics. Then he moved on to industry and he had more than 25 years of experience with Boeing, with Lockheed Martin than many, many years at NASA, and now, as you can see on the slide, the Limitless Space Institute, that he is currently the director of Advanced R&D, Advanced Research and Development, which means he is leading all the R&D efforts at LSI and setting up the priorities. Uh, Sony, uh, we remember your lecture, which was very highly perceived from last summer. Uh, so we are very happy that you are joining us again. So once again, welcome. The stage is yours. Please give a warm welcome. So, yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I think I'll just maybe embellish the bio. My favorite color is yellow. Uh, I like poetry and my lucky number is pi. So there you go. Right. Uh, anyway, just a little bit more background about me before I get into some stuff about uh, interstellar flight. Uh, just as you heard, I worked at NASA for 20 years. Um, I spent the first 10 years working on uh, flight robotics. So I sat on console for uh, building almost the entire International Space Station. But my passion has always been advanced power and propulsion. And so the second half of my career... I got a lot of awesome opportunities to work on advanced power and propulsion, uh, kind of ranging the, the full span of technology readiness level. 
uh, trying to find ways to convince uh, some of the stakeholders in human spaceflight to integrate things uh, like hall thrusters, which is a form of electric propulsion. How many people in the audience have ever even heard of a hall thruster? Okay, some of you have heard of it, some of you have not. For those that have not, uh, a hall thruster is a form of electric propulsion that ionizes a gas and uses electromagnetic and electrostatic fields to accelerate that gas to generate a force. So another way to think of that is think of like a neon sign that leaks, if you will. And so the main value proposition in, in integrating something like that into human spaceflight is it's considerably more fuel efficient uh, than chemical propulsion. And so, uh, but the main difference though is that uh, its thrust is very, very low. So the thrust of electric propulsion compared to chemical propulsion is very, very different. We have to use chemical propulsion to get from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit. So you use you know, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen with rockets that take off and put payloads in, in orbit. But when you're in orbit, you can use other forms of propulsion that have very, very low thrust. Imagine like taking a piece of paper and putting it in your hand. That's the thrust level of like what a haul thruster might be. But it could pay off in the long run. And so some of the things that I worked on when I was at NASA, I looked at putting uh, an electric propulsion and powered test bed on the International Space Station. Uh, we were looking at uh, trying to evaluate the opportunity to test very high power electric propulsion systems in space so we didn't have to worry about environmental effects like the walls of the vacuum chamber affecting some of the results that we would get in the lab. Uh, I also worked on a team putting uh, electric propulsion on the International Space Station to provide drag makeup. And so we worked for about a year and a half to try and uh, look at what that might uh, be. Uh, but in the end, we decided not to go forward with it because the cost was pretty high and we didn't know when the end of the space station program was going to be. Is it 2020? Is it 2024? At the time, it was 2020. And so uh, we opted not to go with that. Uh, but worked a couple other things. Uh, worked the NASA DARPA program looking at putting a, a human outpost in geosynchronous orbit to service satellites in geosync. Uh, very very much integrated electric propulsion into that kind of an architecture. Uh, really makes the system very fuel efficient, but this is uh, definitely the real uh, win for me as a, uh, as a person that's trying to push uh, human spaceflight at the agency. Uh, you know, I worked an architecture team that led to Waypoint Gateway and the stuff that you see with Artemis. Um, and so for a number of iterations, when we were behind closed doors working on these, uh, these ideas for the future, I would always ask about maybe evaluating using haul thrusters on the Waypoint Gateway Station, uh, and they would routinely tell me no. Uh, and they really couldn't imagine how, how that would even be useful for human spaceflight. But over time, I managed to uh, uh, convince them to give me three kilowatts of power, and I was able to evaluate uh, using haul thrusters to desaturate CMGs, that's uh, so control moment gyros on, uh, on the station, uh, and save a little propellant. So they decided to give me nine kilowatts uh, and I eventually they got all the way up to 27 kilowatts. So, but now if you look at the gateway that's uh, going to go be up in the, around the moon, it has hall thrusters in it uh, because of that process. But that whole fight was where I got the nickname Dr. No, because I would ask them to put hall thrusters into the human architecture and they would tell me no. So I had the nickname of Dr. No. So, uh, <clears throat> so before we talk about interstellar flight, I think it's important to at least set the bit to help you understand state of the art when it comes to the idea of interstellar flight. Um, so we do have a spacecraft uh, that's been declared to be in interstellar space. Uh, is our folks familiar with Voyager 1 spacecraft? Some of you are familiar with it. So this is a spacecraft we launched back in the 70s. Gave us a lot of beautiful pictures of the planets in the solar system. Uh, and uh, it's, um, been on, it's been on its journey for about 44 years. And we could ask the question, right, you know, how long would it take this spacecraft to get to another star, right? In 2012, NASA declared it to be beyond the heliopause of the sun. So it's been officially declared to be in interstellar space for a while now. Uh, but uh, at the speed that it's currently going, it would take 75,000 years to get to uh, Proxima Centauri. So I don't know about you, but that seems like a long time to be sitting on console, right? So all, all that to say, chemical propulsion is very useful, uh, and we can use it to do a lot of things. And we've managed to explore lots of destinations in our, in our solar system, but it requires time because there's only so much energy that chemical propulsion can put into a vehicle. 
So at this point, I want to pause and share with you guys a short film that we commissioned uh, by Eric Wernquist. He is a uh, digital artist from Sweden. Uh, he's done a number of videos for NASA over the years. They're very beautiful. Uh, and so we asked him to pull together this video. This is based on another chart that you'll see in my chart deck. And this is a little bit more of an artistic way of communicating what I call the perennial time distance problem about getting humans to the outer solar system and maybe onto the stars one day. Space is really, really big. And so uh, can you get the lights for us? As incredible as it may seem, there will be a time, and it may be closer than you think, when we live on other worlds. The moon, Mars, and in the space between. And when that day comes, just as always, our children will look with curiosity across these new horizons with a desire to go further and to explore what lies beyond. But beyond Mars, the distances between worlds grow immensely, even within our own solar system, and become truly vast in between stars. If we ever want to reach out across these distances, we need to learn how to go fast. Using our current knowledge of physics and engineering, we could build nuclear locomotives to take humans to all the worlds in our solar system. But a starship powered with a nuclear heart aimed for even our closest star, Proxima Centauri, would have to harbor hundreds of generations of people, all living their entire lives aboard before reaching its destination four and a quarter light years away. It would take two years just to reach the orbit of Saturn and another 2,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. We need to be able to go faster. With our current knowledge of physics, but with engineering we have yet to develop, we can imagine a propulsion system with the sun for a heart, a fusion engine that can accelerate a starship up to 5% of the speed of light. This ship could cross the orbit of Saturn in six months and reach Proxima Centauri in just over a century. But if we want to traverse interstellar distances in less than a human lifetime, we have to go incredibly fast. The universe has shown us that this can be done by altering the scale of space itself. And we are working to develop new understandings of physics to learn how this might be controlled. If we could construct a starship with a propulsion system that decreases space in front of it and expands space behind it, this ship could cross enormous distances effectively faster than the speed of light. Such a ship would reach from Mars to Saturn in just a matter of minutes and be able to reach Proxima Centauri in less than six months. From there, there are no limits to where we could go. Perhaps one day, humanity will look up at an alien night sky and strain to find the pale yellow dot that is our sun, our home, and know for the first time, as we look back on ourselves, that we are not alone in the universe.
This journey starts today. video. Uh, so I was glad, glad to get a chance to share it with you guys. If you notice, there was a website uh, at the very bottom of the, uh, the final scene uh, that you saw. That website has kind of a little technical compendium that goes with the, the video. So if you wanted to kind of like dig a little bit deeper into some of the details, right, the, behind some of the numbers that you saw quoted in the movie, you could do that, right? So the, the movie is purposely trying to reach a, a broader audience. And so it's told in a very artistic way. But uh, the website allows us to kind of expand some of the, the, the math and physics behind some of the stuff that goes into that video. And it's uh, you can Google it, uh, go incredibly fast. It's on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it again or share with some friends, you can certainly do that. Uh, so let me switch gears now and talk to you guys a little bit about uh, Limitless Space Institute. Uh, that's where I'm the director of advanced research and development. Um, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond our solar system. Uh, and to support the research and development of enabling technologies. Our pinnacle objective is to work to try and enable interstellar flight uh, by the end of the century. And that is a stupendously difficult goal, as you kind of surmise from looking at the video. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you think about space flight today, uh, we're working at putting human beings back on the surface of the moon uh, in the next couple years in Project Artemis. Um, We've got an awesome rover that's on the surface of Mars uh, that's got a little radioisotope thermal generator that's providing power and it's running around on the surface of Mars and providing us a lot of great imagery and, and science. And those are great illustrations of how space exploration can be done with chemical propulsion. Uh, but if we, if we want to send human beings further out in the solar system, certainly we've talked about Mars a lot, but if we want to send human beings past Mars into the outer solar system, this is a lot more difficult. Consider the following situation. <clears throat> if we wanted to send human beings to Saturn and we want to get them there in 200 days, the amount of energy that's necessary to accomplish that task is an order of magnitude more energy than it takes to get a payload from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit. So all that to say, chemical propulsion just can't close that kind of an architecture. And to do something like that, we actually have to consider some other things. And so this next chart, <clears throat> this is the actual inspiration for that video. This is a little bit more of a technical way of unpacking that, uh, the narrative that you saw. Uh, and this represents the way we view things at Limitless Space Institute and some things that we might do to try and tackle that problem I just talked to you about. Kind of span spanning the, the waterfront of what we know on the left to what we don't know on the right. Uh, so on the left, leftmost swim lane, uh, we have the title fission, and so this is a scenario where we have nuclear electric propulsion. We're using uh, fission as a power source. We are fissioning uranium to provide power that goes to some form of electric propulsion uh, to provide thrust for a vehicle. Now, if you have human beings involved in this, the power levels that are necessary to make something like that viable is going to be in the megawatt level, right? One, two to 50 megawatts, if you will. And to put that in context, uh, in terms of a terrestrial perspective, when, if you've ever sat at a railroad track when a train's going by, uh, each individual train, the, the locomotive itself, when a locomotive goes by, that's anywhere from two to four megawatts of electric power that the, gener the, diesel, uh, the diesel engines are providing for the electric motors on the wheels. Now, this type of an architecture will allow us to send human beings to every location in the solar system. Right, this is well explored in the literature. We understand this. Uh, and this is a course based on known physics and known engineering. Uh, and so certainly it's a way for us to do things to uh, explore the, the, the solar system with humans and maybe even do what I call an interstellar precursor. Uh, and that's out to about 1,000 astronomical units. And so an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth. If you imagine that as a, like a meter stick and you stack that up a thousand times, that's a destination that's been considered in the literature as what we call an interstellar precursor. And so NEP might be able to do something like that, uh, but it will not be able to do uh, true interstellar. The, we're limited by the exhaust velocity 
of the electric propulsion systems that are on the spacecraft. They just can't provide em enough energy to be able to do interstellar in anything less than a couple thousand years. So we want to try and do interstellar uh, in something a little bit more uh, that we can connect with, say about a, a century, or some people might even speculate we could achieve 50 years, but I, I tend to stick with about a century. Uh, we need to move a little bit into the unknown and think about using fusion as the power system for the spacecraft. Now, contrary to what Iron Man might tell you, we don't have compact fusion reactors that, uh, uh, like they have in the, in the movies, uh, but we are getting a little closer with terrestrial fusion. So fusion power, fusion power for terrestrial applications may be a little, little bit sooner than some folks think. But fusion has the distinct advantage of giving us much better power and propulsion systems for these types of missions. And we can actually make uh, a, a mission to Proxima Centauri in about 100 some odd years. Certainly that would also enable faster human exploration of the solar system. Has anyone ever seen the TV show Expanse? Right, so that's, that's a great example. The, the whole mechanism of that TV show is fusion propulsion. Although they, they intimate it has very, very high uh, thrust levels, I don't know that we'll quite achieve that level of, of thrust. It's, it's monumental, but um, hey, it's TV shows, right? Um, so, but fusion has the potential to really uh, give us access to the stars within the context of known physics. We just have to kind of work out, oops, we just have to work out uh, some of the engineering um, now, if we want to try and do an interstellar mission in a fraction of a human lifetime, let's say we want to try and do Proxima Centauri in 20 years instead of 100 years. For that, we are definitely going to have to look to the frontiers of physics. We're going to have to explore beyond the physics models that we currently know today. If you think of the totality of what we know of physics as a Venn diagram, if you will, there's going to be two circles on this Venn diagram and they're gonna to touch at a single tangent point. Uh, in one circle, you're gonna have the words quantum mechanics, and that represents our best understanding of the microscopic world. Uh, uh, and of course, that's why cell phones work, why computers work, that uh, mastery of material science. Uh, and in the other circle, uh, you would have the words general relativity, and that helps us understand how the stars and the cosmos move. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that's why we have hyper accurate global positioning satellites. So. Just that knowledge of physics, I mean, you probably use that at least once a week in terms of using the cell phone to navigate to go see a friend, right, at a new restaurant or a coffee shop. Um, but those two circles in the Venn diagram don't overlap. And because those two circles don't overlap, we know there is a more generalized framework that we have to figure out. And so in the process of working on the frontiers of physics, maybe we can figure out new things that won't occur to us based on the context of those, those two uh, circles on the Venn diagram. Think about E equals MC squared, for example. E equals, e equals MC squared was derived in 1905. Uh, we split the first atom in 1932. Uh, we had the first nuclear reactor in uh, 1942. And then, of course, the Trinity test in 1945. But that was all without computers, right? So sometimes the value of new insights into physics can translate to uh, technologies that change our whole understanding of the, of, of the universe and it changes how we, how we live our lives. So, but working on the frontiers of physics, maybe we can figure out things like, we know from general relativity that um, wormholes and space warps are mathematically possible, but we don't know how to build something like that. We, we couldn't begin to tell you how, what to, to put into the nacelles of the, the, the starship, uh, but what about uh, space drives? Is there some way for us to interact with the fabric of space-time, whatever that's made of, the quantum vacuum, if you will. Is there some way for us to impart a force or a momentum on a background field to generate a force to move a spacecraft? That could potentially have significant payoffs for architectures. And I got a couple slides we'll look at in a minute just to, to illustrate that. So this is kind of the trade space that we <clears throat> that we see. Now, there are a lot of other things I could talk about, but in the interest in, be, in at least being brief and covering a lot of it, this is kind of our, our chart we stick with. But we do think about things like solar sails, matter, antimatter propulsion. There's a lot of other things and subtleties, but this, this sh should give you a good, uh, uh, like a Neapolitan ice cream overview of, of uh, advanced power and propulsion. Now at Limitless Space Institute, we are a doing organization. As I said, our mission is, is to inspire and educate uh, and then conduct research. And so we, we try and put, uh, put rubber on the road. Uh, we conduct research internally uh, in our EagleWorks lab. 
We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Currently, we're, <clears throat> we're working on making some custom Casimir cavities to explore a fundamental physics model. So this would definitely be an effort that's tracing to that rightmost swim lane. We're trying to fill in some of the gap, uh, maybe between those two circles in the Venn diagram. Uh, we conduct work, uh, we fund research externally through our interstellar initiative grants uh, program. We, uh, this is a biennial R&D program that we have. Uh, we ask universities all over the globe to submit uh, proposals to us and then we select uh, a certain number of those for funding. And so we just finished the 2020 to 2022 uh, grant cycle uh, with nine winners. We funded uh, research topics such as relativistic solar sails. Uh, we funded uh, a team working on beamed energy propulsion, four fusion propulsion uh, grants, two were funded to work on space drives, and then one was funded to work on traversable wormholes. And we're doing that in partnership with Texas A&M uh, and Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, I think Pete Warden will be here next week, right? And so uh, Pete's very much uh, involved in this process with us, with these uh, external entities. Uh, we do university partnerships. Uh, we're currently funding Texas A&M uh, Nuclear Engineering Department to work on a portable nuclear reactor, about one megawatt electric. Uh, so you can see that that number kind of traces to that NEP swim lane I was telling you about the nuclear electric propulsion. We, we don't have one megawatt electric nuclear reactors in space. Uh, we only have very small radioisotope thermal generators that are about 500 watts. Um, but <clears throat> the uh, work that we're doing at Texas a and Nuclear Engineering Department is very much aligned with a current Department of Defense program called Project Pele, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the at the end of the talk. Uh, we have internships, uh, graduate fellowships, uh, postdoc fellowships. Uh, we actually are teaching a summer course on interstellar topics. Uh, it's a week long course. We commissioned uh, the Initiative for Interstellar Studies to. Uh, create this class. Uh, it started on Monday this week, so uh, they're already uh, in process right now, and so we'll potentially teach that again. So this is the second time uh, we've taught this class, so maybe keep your eye out for it next year in case it might be something that you're interested in uh, listening to. And of course, we do education outreach, lots of uh, public outreach, talking to students and universities and uh, high schools, all, all age levels. So, And we're actually trying to increase our K through 12 footprint uh, we're trying to go through the process of developing classroom materials to give to teachers and allow them to engage with students in middle school, elementary school, and high school, uh, talking about space and getting them excited about it. So this is a chart that shows organizations that we already have contractual uh, engagements with. We've only been at this since effectively 2020, uh, at the dawn of the zombie apocalypse, if you will. Uh, but we've been we've been pretty busy. Uh, we've got over 20 some on entities that we have formal contracts with, uh, and we have several already in discussion. We intend to grow that uh, as we continue to move forward. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, <clears throat> the work that we're doing internally. Uh, uh, we are currently uh, working on again. I said the kind of a frontiers of physics model called the the dynamic vacuum. We're trying to consider some of the implications of this fundamental physics model as it pertains to some custom Casimir cavities. Uh, you see these little small parallel plate cavities and these tapered plate cavities. These are uh, would be very, very small. We're talking like microns in terms of separation. Uh, and we know from quantum mechanics, right, that the concept of empty space is not really empty. There are vacuum fluctuations that pop into and out of existence all the time. And so a classical observational consequence of the, of the idea of the quantum vacuum is if you put two plates in close proximity to one another, they restrict which vacuum fluctuation modes can manifest in between the two plates. And as a result, when you integrate the, uh, the vacuum fluctuations between the two plates versus the vacuum fluctuations on the outside, there is a disparity. And so there's a negative vacuum energy density that manifests itself inside the cavity uh, that we can we can measure in the form of the Casimir force that tries to pull those two plates together. Uh, now that's just the, tr the current perspective that we have on the quantum vacuum, but we think there's a little bit more to it. The dynamic vacuum model that we're working with suggests that there's some structure to that negative vacuum energy density that exists between these two plates, and maybe we can detect that, number one, 
Number two, maybe we could potentially utilize that in some type of a technological apparatus. So for example, it has the potential to provide very small uh, but persistent levels of power. Uh, we might be able to find ways to increase the magnitude of that negative vacuum energy density that manifests between those two plates. And that actually has uh, pertinence to optics such as metamaterials or maybe even the idea of a space warp, right? The, the necessary ingredient to make the idea of a space warp or a wormhole even work is something called exotic matter. And so exotic matter in general relativity uh, mathematically looks like negative vacuum energy density in the context of quantum mechanics. And so it's always been talked about in the literature as being a proxy for exotic matter whenever we talk about it in the context of general relativity. We'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, and so <clears throat> we may also have some implications for communications and sensors. If we have these tapered devices, they may be able to initiate uh, waves in the quantum vacuum. We call them longitudinal waves in the quantum vacuum. Uh, where we could potentially initiate and detect those that may also have some implications for sensors. Uh, there may be a small chance that we could actually generate a force that we could use in space, but it has to be better than a photon rocket. Otherwise, why even use it? Um, so some of you were in a lecture I gave, a workshop that I gave uh, earlier uh, while I was here last week uh, talking about pilot wave theory. Uh, and so the dynamic vacuum model that we're working on falls into this category of a pilot wave theory. And so what does that really even mean? Uh, to, 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 to keep it brief, uh, the, the current perspective that you would get from quantum mechanics uh, is something called the Copenhagen interpretation. And so what the Copenhagen interpretation effectively says is that at the microscopic level, reality is not real, it's probabilistic, right? And so I, I'm trying to illustrate a point. This has to do with the fact that uh, quantum mechanics has a lot of probabilistic nature and how you do the calculations. Uh, and so um, the Copenhagen interpretation is effectively that, whereas the pilot wave approach would say at the microscopic level, reality is real and it is deterministic. And so the pilot wave theory was actually born at the exact same time as the Copenhagen interpretation back in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, and it's actually seeing a resurgence of interest uh, in the community. Uh, and so a number of folks are working on different models and we're working on a particular model that has the, the, the main tenet that we, we feel that the quantum vacuum is a, a dynamic medium. And so it can vary both spatially and temporally. And so what does that mean? That means that the quantum vacuum can manifest longitudinal wave modes. And so what that says is whatever the quantum vacuum is made of, the internal constituents are capable of interacting and exchanging momentum. And so that's a very significant statement to be able to say that. So we published a paper in uh, uh, Physics Open, uh, references here at the bottom, where we derived the acoustic wave equation from the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and then we, throw, we showed through some de detailed numerical modeling, we could replicate all of the standard orbitals that we would expect to see just looking at things with just purely with the Schrodinger equation. So we were able to show the s orbital, the p orbitals, the d orbitals, the f orbitals, <clears throat> and the energies of these orbitals matched match observation, which you you would need your theory to do if you're trying to provide an alternate viewpoint of things. Uh, so we think that this is a, a, a good finding that uh, the quantum vacuum does have the potential to manifest longitudinal waves. From the standpoint, we were able to show that electron orbitals may indeed be acoustic resonances in this quantum vacuum field. We expanded that line of thinking to look at uh, molecular chemistry. We looked at uh, molecular hydrogen and showed that uh, a molecular hydrogen is also potentially an acoustic resonance in this uh, dynamic vacuum field. Uh, and so all, all this is just background. When you're trying to look at some type of a new technological Im implementation or a scientific experiment, you also have a lot of existing data uh, that you can look at and try and figure out if your ideas predict all the things that we already know. Right, so if, you, if, your, if your idea predicts something that doesn't comport with what we already know, then that tells you there's a problem. So that's why you're seeing us go through this particular effort. We have done some work to look at uh, both nuclear and uh, gravity. Perhaps gravity may be emergent, but those are very early thought processes. We don't have anything published in that yet. We're not quite ready for that, but that, uh, that'll be something that we look at. But this is kind of, you're seeing why when I talk about the fact this model may be a little bit of a circle that transcribes both the quantum mechanics circle and the general relativity circle.
time will tell. In terms of the nanofabrication, you know, I showed you cartoons. These are actual devices that we have managed to manufacture. It's taken us about uh, a year and a half uh, to figure out how to make these things. And they are very difficult to make. We, we end up uh, making about one out of every 10 or 20 that actually uh, works. Uh, this goes through and shows uh, some work that was done at Texas A&M with a 3D printer. They actually have 3D printers that can print down at the nanometer level. This is a NanoScribe GT printer. Uh, and so it prints in, it prints in the photoresist. Uh, and then we can go through and plate these later with metal. But you can see the plates uh, and then the pillars that are in the center there. Uh, and then this shows some work that was done at MIT by Isentis using the nanofabrication facilities up there. Uh, this uses traditional etching machines like a deep reactive ion etcher. Now the significance of this is this this gap here is about 10 microns. These pillars are about five micrometers in diameter, but the height is about 40 micrometers. So it's a very high aspect ratio device. It's, that's, that's why it's taken us so long to figure out how to make these. No one makes this type of topology uh, in, the, in, the, in the chip industry right now. So we've had to kind of learn how to do all that just to get to a point where we could potentially try and measure something in the lab. So how do we analyze how the quantum vacuum responds to these things? We use a technique called the numerical world line approach to the, uh, measuring how the, the energy density is predicted to manifest in these cavities. The main issue we're concerned about by making a, a Casimir cavity that has something inside of it like these pillars is how do the, how do the pillars affect the quantum vacuum field? Because they have the potential to shield themselves from the very effect that we're trying to measure. So we want to try and understand the quantum vacuum evanescent fields as the, as the, whatever the perturbation is in the free space, how does that decay as it moves into materials, right? And so we have to have a technique that allows us to measure the evanescent fields as they actually might occur in the material or in, as you move further into the walls. And so this technique allows us to do that. We have an algorithm that goes through and creates thousands of these massless scalar field vacuum fluctuations. Uh, and then we go through and we measure the energy density distribution in the structure as a result of that. And so, as I said, the primary concern was do the pillars shield themselves from the very effect that we're trying to measure? And so this analysis technique shows us that they do not. There is, you notice there's like a little bit of a lime green shade that goes right through the middle. This is where the energy density is at its, at its peak. And so the pillars do not self shield themselves. They will potentially see uh, in this case, a polarization field in the quantum vacuum uh, that we might be able to detect using some laboratory equipment. So whenever we go through and we do the world line analysis, we'll then go through in this case for case one, uh, we'll take those, uh, those results. And this, by the way, this is takes like thousands of CPUs to be able to do this. It's a it's an analytic monster. It takes a long time to get uh, get answers for this. But once we get that hard part done, we can import the material, uh, import import the results into Comsol, come up with a prediction for a polarization field, put in the material properties of the structure that's around it, and then that will give us a prediction uh, for the voltage potential that we might see as a result of the vacuum polarization that we conjecture uh, may be going on as a result of this dynamic vacuum field. Now, when we look at the tapered devices, we, we do the same thing. We use the numerical world line approach to come up with the negative vacuum energy density distribution for a tapered plate. Uh, and then we can use ComSol to come up with a prediction for a force in case we wanna try and measure the force that they might manifest, manifest with an, an atomic force microscope. But one of the things we wanted to understand is if we take this negative vacuum energy density distribution and we import it into ComSol and we tell ComSol to calculate the velocity field that's required to sustain that negative vacuum energy density, right? We find that the, the flow field is, uh, there is a net flow that has to be present uh, for that negative vacuum energy density. So that says we might indeed be able to generate something or make something that uh, could generate a force or certainly generate a longitudinal wave that we might be able to detect with another sensor. So like longitudinal wave communications, that's like a new way to communicate other than electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and that might allow us to do things that we currently can't think about doing with, with standard technologies. So that was an encouraging finding. 
Now, in terms of <clears throat> trying to measure uh, the phenomenon that we think is going on here, we can use something called a four-point probe uh, measurement technique where we use a very sensitive source meter and we use a very sensitive voltmeter to go through and generate the voltage current curves for the prototypes. That's typically what one would do if you're trying to measure the performance of a solar cell. You would go through and measure the voltage current relationship for the device that you're trying to measure. And that would give you a sense of the power capability of it or any of the other characteristics you're trying to look at from a material science perspective. Uh, we also have the, the ability to measure uh, the transient phenomena. We have a, an oscilloscope that can measure uh, 20 giga samples per second. Uh, and through differential signal processing, we can get down into the microvolt regime with that. But of the two, the, the four-point probe technique is considerably more precise and accurate than the oscilloscope is, but we'll, we will use both techniques as we continue to move forward. Uh, and then <clears throat> the other thing is, we're, you, you saw from those uh, uh, analysis results, we're predicting that there is a polarization field that's present in these cavities that manifests in the form of electrostatic patch charges that occur on the structure. And so there's actually a way for us to go directly measure that using an atomic force microscope using what's called a Kelvin probe force microscopy mode. And so what is that? Well, this first off, this is an atomic force microscope. And if you were to zoom in right here in the very center, there's a little a probe tip that consists of something like this, where the width of this guy is about uh, one millimeter by two millimeters. And then there's a tiny little whisker that comes off the front. This is not two scale. It would be about uh, maybe 10 microns long and a couple of microns wide. This little tip that comes down would, would actually come down to a single atom, right? So it's a, a very sensitive device. You can actually use this atomic force microscope to go trace out lattice structure. You can actually see individual atoms with this particular device. Uh, but we, we use the Kelvin Pro Force mic microscopy mode to allow us to see the patch charges as they might exist on the surface of these devices. Well, how does it do that? Well, <clears throat> the atomic force microscope, looking at that little top diagram there, <clears throat> it, uh, it goes to the process of, of measuring the, the topology of a surface. Let's say you've got your you're going to go through and create a series of lines to create a two-dimensional picture of what you're looking at. And so for each one of those individual lines, the first thing it'll do is it'll go through and do what's called a tap test mode, where it will go through and measure the topology of the surface, right? And then it'll lift up off the surface and fly back, but it'll, it'll charge the tip with an AC voltage that oscillates it, and then it'll apply a DC bias voltage. And when that DC bias voltage is, minimizes the amplitude of that oscillation, that's when you know what the voltage is directly underneath the tip. And so that's a way for us to go through and measure the electrostatic patch charges as they exist on these devices. And so just to show you some of the results, uh, we may have a couple more years worth of work that we need to do, but this is at least some additional uh, findings we can talk to you guys about today. This is a Kelvin probe force microscopy scan, a 30 micron by 30 micron scan of this particular device. The height here represents the voltage potential. That's not to physical height that represents the voltage potential. And so when we rotate that view, you can see that the, uh, the walls are at a higher voltage potential than the pillars, uh, which is what we anticipated. Uh, and so that's some encouraging initial results, but we wanna test a lot of other things and make sure it's what we think it is, right? In, in, in uh, empirical physics, uh, it pays to be paranoid, right? And so it just, unfortunately it takes time and you have to be very tedious. Uh, doing the four-point probe technique, uh, this particular curve, we just got this about a month ago. This is a, uh, the error bars that are on this plot are five sigma error bars. Uh, so we know from this voltage current relationship for this particular device that you see on the left, uh, it has a non-zero open circuit voltage and a non-zero short circuit current. So if you were to look at a solar cell, for example, you would expect to see uh, this kind of behavior where the curve does not intersect with zero. And so because the error bars are five sigma, that lets us know that this is at least a real signal. It doesn't mean it's what we're looking for. We still, again, have to go through a lot of work to confirm that. So, uh, but we can at least share that with you today. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears there. You know, sometimes when you're doing fundamental research, you do run into unanticipated findings, right? Just in the process of working on the frontiers of physics, things happen. And so it turns out the work that we were doing with these custom Casimir cavities did have a potential intersection 
uh, with the idea of a space warp a little bit more directly than we ever thought. So uh, for folks that aren't familiar, there's a, a model out there called the Kubier metric. Uh, this is a paper published in 1994 by a physicist by the name of Miguel Kubier that kind of captures the idea of a space warp. We know from cosmology that space can expand and contract at any particular speed. There's no, there's no limit to, to, to the speed of expansion and contraction. And we know that the universe underwent a very large inflate, uh, a very high speed inflationary phase at the very dawn of the universe where points in the universe went racing away from one another at very incredible uh, speeds. So the universe can do it, right? But the question is, could we potentially do it? And so Miguel Acobier wanted to understand what is the math necessary to make something like this work if we were to try and create something that could go uh, very, very fast, uh, just like we see in the, in the TV shows. And so what you see here, this is a plot. Uh, this is the York time plot. This is the expansion and contraction of space in response to the presence of a toroidal ring of exotic matter uh, that would be potentially connected to some kind of a spaceship proper here in the center with some velocity V that could be up to, you know, whatever number you want, 10 C, 100 C, just pick the number. Um, and so he created the mathematics for that. Uh, but it, as I said, it does require exotic matter. And so uh, in the context of general relativity, that gives us pause for concern because we don't know how to make exotic matter in the context of general relativity. But in quantum mechanics, this stuff called negative vacuum energy density has all the mathematical characteristics of exotic matter. Uh, and Alcubierre in his paper in 1994 highlighted the fact that although this violates a number of energy conditions in general relativity, uh, the Casimir phenomena might be something that we could bring to bear for uh, the stuff that's required to make this kind of a, a trick potentially work. So, you know, how, from a, you know, a day to day perspective, how does this even work? A way to think of this is we've all been to airports where you have gates that are separated by very large distances. And so in order to help people get from one gate to another a little bit more quickly, they have these things called travelators, those little horizontal conveyor belts, right? That help speed us along to get from one location to another. And so that is a, a loose analog, if you will, for how the idea of a space warp works. When you're on your own power walking, let's say at about three miles an hour, uh, and then you step onto one of these travelator belts, all of a sudden you'll be, you'll be covering distance more quickly. It might actually look to somebody sitting in a chair watching you walk that you're going six miles an hour, whereas locally you were only doing three miles an hour. And if you think about it, that belt, what's happening with the belt? The belt is contracting the space in front of you, if you will, because it's, it's going underneath. Right, and it's expanding the, the, the space behind you because the belt's coming up behind you. That's kind of a, a loose terrestrial analog for the idea of a space warp. Um, <clears throat> now this is just, just to let you see what the mathematics looks like. Don't, you, don't, you don't have to understand this. I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the important pieces. Uh, this, is the, this is the equation that represents the York time and that's what you see plotted out here. Uh, but more importantly, when you, when you figure out what does this mean in the context of the energy density that's what drives you to require this uh, toroidal ring that uh, is necessary to manifest this spherical warp bubble. Now, it has some appealing characteristics. This was interesting that Alcubierre just created this model and it just has some of these appealing characteristics already built into it. Uh, inside the little warp bubble that forms around this uh, spacecraft as a result of this ring being here, space-time is flat, right? The uh, divergence of phi is zero, but uh, it's, it's a very benign, it's like zero gravity, if you will. Even when they turn the warp on and off, it's a very benign environment. The, the mission clocks uh, on board the spacecraft, sorry, the clocks on board the spacecraft are synchronized with the clocks on, in the mission control. So this is not some kind of a special relativistic trick where you have somebody traveling very close to the speed of light, making time look like it's going slow. Um, and then of course, in coordinate times, proper time. Uh, and then the proper acceleration in the bubble is formally zero. So when you turn on the warp bubble, people don't go splatting against the bulkhead uh, and making for a very short, sad episode of Star Trek. All right, so. Uh, now it does have an unappealing characteristic. <clears throat> uh, in, I think in 2000, uh, 2009 timeframe, the best estimate for the amount of exotic matter uh, that was necessary to make this kind of a trick work uh, was published in literature to be about the size of Jupiter, right? So this would make, this would really make you think, hey, this is mathematically possible and maybe the universe can do it, but it's unlikely that we could ever do that. 
And so I got asked to come present some uh, talks at uh, the NASA DARPA 100 Year Starship Symposium. And I think Pete was one of the organizers of that. Um, and so I did some, uh, uh, some numerical analysis of the field equations. And I figured out there were two optimization techniques that we could use to decrease the amount of exotic matter that's necessary to make the trick work. Uh, number one is you change the thickness of that ring that goes around the spacecraft. All the assumptions that have been done in literature were always assuming the rings were very, very thin. Think of it being like a, a wedding band. It's just a very thin aspect ratio or a belt, if you will. Uh, so what I found is if you make the ring a little bit more, say like a lifesaver, uh, you can decrease the magnitude of the strain. This is like a volumetric strain on space time. You can decrease the strain on space time. And so that reduces the amount of exotic matter non-linearly. So a very significant improvement with this optimization. Uh, and then we also looked at some mathematics expanding the idea into higher dimensional physics. And what we found is if you oscillate the bubble intensity, uh, that also provides another mechanism to reduce the amount of exotic matter that's necessary to make the trick work. And so we, we found, I wanted to be able to duplicate the work that was done by my colleague, Richard Obusi that produced the Jupiter solution. So I looked at a spacecraft that was about 10 meters in diameter with an effective velocity of 10 C. Uh, and, there's, and there's nothing special about either one of those numbers. The spacecraft could be 100 meters, the speed could be 100 C, whatever. Uh, but it was just for the purpose of calculations. Uh, for in this case, a 10 meter diameter spacecraft with an effective velocity of 10 C, I can construct it with a very thin aspect ratio of that, that toroidal ring <clears throat> such that I, ha I require a Jupiter amount of exotic matter, and then using the optimization techniques, we can get that down to something just right under a metric ton or something about the size of the Voyager spacecraft. And so that at least says, maybe it's not totally impossible, but we still don't really know how, what do we build to put into these rings? We don't really know fully yet. Well, here's where we had a little bit of an exciting finding with the work that we were doing for, for DARPA on these custom Casimir cavities. When we were looking at the detail of how the quantum vacuum responds to the presence of the plates and the pillar, when you look at the negative vacuum energy density that exists around that pillar, you see this is a plot right here of that uh, uh, negative vacuum energy density distribution. And you compare that to what's required for the Okubia warp metric. So this is directly from the, the, the field equations. Uh, and you see qualitatively, there are some similar similarities in these, in these two dimensional section cuts, right? But the main difference is this solution, these are prismatic, right? So they they come in and out of the page, uh, just like the, uh, uh, the plate pillar structure over here, whereas this is toroidal based on that. And so we went to the trouble to look at a model where we had a four micron diameter cylinder surrounded by Oh, sorry, four micron diameter cylinder around a one micron diameter sphere. And when we did that analysis, we showed that negative vacuum energy density that matches the requirements for the Okubier metric. Uh, and so we published a paper in uh, EPJC in 2021. So if you're interested in that, you can go download that. But, uh, you know, this is a potential structure. Maybe we could, you know, 3D print something like this using a NanoScribe GT printer and maybe try and conduct some kind of an experiment where we can see, can we change optic properties? of something to a point where we could actually measure that. So uh, but the, the significance of this work is we're able to publish a paper where we were able to say to the community, if you build this real structure, it is predicted to manifest a real nanoscale warp bubble. Now, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to do anything. But it's still the first time that we can say as a community that this is something that you could build that might manifest the idea of a nano warp bubble in the lab. So sometimes it pays to be doing fundamental research. We didn't go into this trying to find that. That was just an accidental finding. Uh, just a quick aside on space drives. You know, I talked about that in uh, the three swim lanes, uh, space warps, wormholes, and space drives. Well, you know, being able to generate force by pushing out the fabric of space time, how would that potentially be useful? Uh, well, if you don't have to be connected to a big propellant tank, it can actually make a big difference, even if you have, you know, you still have low thrust to power, if you will. So uh, this comes from a paper that I uh, published with uh, Kent Justin, looking at the idea of a space drive applied to some of the traditional problems we've thought about at the agency. Uh, in this case, the uh, thrust to power was about 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. So that's about an order of magnitude higher than a Hall thruster. 
but still very low in terms of uh, uh, thrust. And so the spacecraft is 35 metric ton crew module, a 10 metric ton power system with one megawatt electric. So that's uh, that's a pretty modest uh, power system in terms of how light we're trying to make it. Propulsion system is about 10 metric tons. Uh, the significance here is this 0.73 milligees. In the process of exploring this, uh, 0.73 milligees was a discovery that in, in, the, in the realm of low thrust, when you can have a spacecraft that has an acceleration value higher than 0.6 milligees at one astronomical unit from the sun, you effectively have a thrust to weight ratio greater than one in the heliocentric frame. And so that means you can start tracing out trajectories that are radial in the solar system. We've never looked at that when we've done chemical propulsion because it, it, it's a totally different way of doing things. And so that's a, a significant threshold that we no one really knew existed until we did this paper uh, that this, uh, this 0.6 milligees changes how all the trajectory optimizers generate trajectories. So it was really neat to see the impact of that. And so that, that number may also have, have pertinence even independent of a space drive, but, uh, you know, because the NEP could potentially achieve that same thrust of power. Um, you can see here uh, a mission from Mar Earth to Mars. You can get, uh, you can get there fairly quickly. Uh, um, uh, let's see, what's the transit time on there? I thought it was like 30 days or something. It might have fallen off the side there. Anyway. Uh, let's pop on to the next one. This is a this is another illustration of the fact if you have a space drive system, it is a delta V machine. It will uh, it changes the way we do things. So one of the things that Kent Jusen and I wanted to look at was when you look at the so Earth and Mars have a synodic period with one another, right? They don't orbit around the sun at the exact same rate. They have a two and one seventh year synodic period. And so if you're trying to deal with phasing, typically with chemical propulsion, we just wait. But if you have a space drive system, you can actually do these, the, the trajectory optimizer will produce these very bizarre solutions uh, where you'll actually go through and arrest your, your orbital velocity, retrofire, and then rephase with Mars. Uh, and so we could potentially have a scenario where you would be able to leave for Mars at any particular time you wanted if you were always willing to wait 200 days to get there. You might have short trips, you might have longer trips. Uh, but from a, a, a NASA perspective, we always looked at 180 to 220 days. So if we were comfortable with something like that, the idea of a space drive would allow us to go to Mars anytime. Uh, <clears throat> so this is interesting. Again, you can see here's this example of a radial trajectory that I was talking about. You won't, you just won't see that with with uh, 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 other forms of propulsion. Uh, if you can't get the thrust to mass ratio uh, above 0.6 milligees. So here we have a spacecraft that has a thrust to mass of about 0.9 milligees, uh, two megawatts of power. Uh, and so the spacecraft is 90 metric tons. So this is something that Starship could potentially launch or maybe like SLS block 2A or something. Uh, but this is a mission to Mars, sorry, to, to Saturn where it can get to Saturn in 269 days with two megawatts of power. So that's, it's amazing that it's that low. Uh, and then of course do a, a whole mission series looking at all the different uh, moons around Saturn and coming back. And so total mission duration for this is 950 days. And so the significance of that number for, for, for folks familiar with things like design reference architecture 5.0, uh, sending humans to Mars, they've always been missions that's anywhere between uh, 700 to 1100 days. So being able to do a mission like this in 950 days is uh, significant. And so this shows the value proposition for trying to figure, is there a way for us to impart force on some kind of a vacuum field or, or space-time manifold, right? So that there is a lot of value in looking at the idea of a space drive. Uh, this goes through and shows an interstellar precursor to 1,000 AU. It can get there in 5.6 years. This is that same 90 metric ton spacecraft. Uh, two megawatts of power, 0.4 newtons per kilowatt. It can get to 1,000 AU in 5.6 years. And so remember, we talked about Voyager 1 has been on its way for 44 years, and it's about uh, 156, 157 astronomical units. And then this is the real, uh, a real nice find. This is, so although I said in the, the three swim lane, the nuclear electric propulsion cannot do interstellar, if it's connected to a traditional form of electric propulsion, if we could connect it to a space drive, if we could ever invent something like that, if the if the uh, if physics will allow that, then we could potentially have a nuclear electric propulsion system that's a single 90 metric ton vehicle 
uh, with two megawatts of power that could make it to Proxima Centauri in just over a century. So very significant. All right, so just a few more minutes here and I'll be, I'll be done and we can take some questions. Uh, I just wanna highlight some of the stuff we did as part of the external research and development that we supported at uh, Limitless Space Institute. As I said, we have this grant program that runs every two years. Uh, we just finished the 2022 to 2024 cycle, uh, sorry, 2020 to 2022 cycle. Uh, I have a whole bunch of proposals I have to review when I get back home for the 22 to 24 cycle. Uh, so this, this round we funded uh, Professor Phil Lubin at UC Santa Barbara for beamed energy propulsion. Uh, this particular proposal traces to breakthrough Starshot's reference mission where you have a very large ground array of lasers that will uh, shine these lasers on a solar sail and accelerate it to 20% the speed of light in about eight minutes, uh, get it to about 20% the speed of light and get to Proxima Centauri uh, quite quickly. But in order to do that, they have to be able to coherently combine lasers on the target. And so the work that we paid Phil to do is to build three laser targets, uh, build three laser uh, sources and a cooperative target to be able to show that he can he can create a coherent array from distributed uh, laser heads and test out to kilometer distances. Uh, we funded Professor Richard Norty at uh, Delft University of Technology to work on relativistic solar sails. That beamed energy propulsion thing I just talked about, that sail is going to accelerate to 20% the speed of light. Uh, and so the sail has to be reflective over a fairly large wavelength of light. And so uh, Richard was looking at some nanostructures that might make that uh, structure reflective on a larger wavelength of light. Uh, we funded several teams working on fusion propulsion. Uh, Ray Sedwick, uh, University of Maryland, uh, using an... Is there something wrong with the sound? Um, <clears throat> we funded Ray Sedwick uh, working on an E cross B shear flow stabilization model. This is just some initial work to take a, a zero dimensional model and uh, expanding it a little bit. Uh, we funded uh, Professor uh, Jason Cassabri at uh, University of Alabama Huntsville uh, to work on uh, to work on some uh, uh, pulsed fusion. Uh, we actually uh, did some testing where they were able to ignite some real uh, fusion targets, and they're trying to figure out where does their concept fall on this puddle plot where the blue section is a physics coefficient of performance less than one, and the yellow is a physics coefficient of performance greater than one. Uh, and so they have the ability to test uh, uh, everything below where I'm kind of tracing that line. Uh, we also funded uh, Kelvin Long uh, to do some work on some code to provide detailed modeling for uh, uh, electrostatic confinement fusion where you ignite a fusion propeller, uh, sorry, a fusion target uh, with lasers to generate a fusion pulse. Uh, this is actually the propulsion technique that was used in the, the British Interplanetary Society reference mission called Project uh, Daedalus. This was an interstellar mission that would uh, potentially go to Bernard Star in, I think it was 50 years, uh, but it was a massive, massive spacecraft, as you can see, in comparison to Saturn V. Uh, we funded uh, Helicity Space in partnership with uh, Caltech and University of Maryland, Baltimore County on a fusion propulsion technique. This one was unique where this particular approach is not meant to provide power to the spacecraft. It has a physics coefficient of performance of about five, so it's not capable of generating electrical watts and feed to the spacecraft stack and feed to the, to the fusion propulsion system itself. You have to plug it in to some kind of a power source, a solar panel, nuclear reactor, what, whatever, you, whatever you think, right? Uh, now you might be asking, but that's kind of counter what you're supposed to expect from fusion propulsion, but consider the following. Uh, if you have a physics coefficient, or physics coefficient of performance of five, that means you're potentially getting five times the amount of jet power from uh, a certain amount of input power. So instead of having a, a 100 kilowatt system uh, driving electric propulsion, it might look like you have a 500 kilowatt system, if you will, because you're getting a lot of thermal power directly into uh, the jet. Uh, we funded the Professor John Bush at MIT doing some work on, this is another pilot wave theory, uh, hydrodynamic quantum field theory. They were doing the fundamental work necessary to figure out the characteristics of the manifold to see if they can indeed generate a force by uh, interacting with it. Uh, we also funded uh, UNLAB and Technion Israel Institute of Technology to work on uh, studying how does the quantum vacuum respond to the presence of a, uh, an RTD uh, if you integrate the vacuum fluctuation modes over that particular structure, 
it will result in an asymmetric uh, force predicted on that structure. And so they, they went through the process of measuring the magnitude of that thrust and, they, and could they potentially measure it in the lab. Uh, we funded Professor Remo Garantini doing some fundamental work on uh, wormholes, traversable wormholes. In this case, we wanted him to uh, focus on uh, trying to figure out, could he increase the magnitude of the phenomena by using superconductors or could he use multiple plates, if you will, with a Casimir cavity uh, to try and uh, optimize the solution? And then, of course, we, I, I said that the, uh, earlier we funded uh, Texas A&M working on a portable nuclear reactor. Uh, the Department of Defense has something called Project Pele, where they are wanting to manufacture a, uh, a terrestrial nuclear reactor that would fit in a 40-foot conics container. They want to be able to provide electric power to a growing electrified fleet. And so what we're trying to do with our effort of funding Texas A&M is we're trying to have a detailed white paper where we can have conversations with, with members of the Department of Defense and, and other folks to say, if you add a few additional requirements to your solicitation, we could potentially re, uh, generate a nuclear reactor that would be 70% capable of what we might need to use in space. And so we're trying to find ways to stretch those dollars and maybe get a little bit, little bit more value for, for what we're trying to do. And of course, that, that traces back to that first swim lane I talked to you guys about nuclear electric propulsion. Uh, and in case you weren't familiar, we actually did do a portable nuclear reactor in the 60s. Uh, they generated a nuclear reactor that was potentially going to generate up to 3.3 megawatts thermal. Uh, they built it to scale and tested it and ran it all, all the way up to about 66%. But uh, I, I don't think we were ready. We, the material science wasn't there. The computational uh, uh, analysis wasn't there, so I, I don't think that was the right time for it, but I think it's the right time for it now. Uh, so we'll finish with just a fun aside. Um, this is a picture of a concept starship for the TV show Star Trek uh, called the XCV-330. Uh, this was done by Matthew Jeffries, who actually, you know, generated the familiar Star Trek Enterprise thing that we might all be familiar with, the, the sombrero and the nacelles. Uh, this was an earlier concept that he had come up with. Um, but you'll notice, based on what I talked to you guys about, the field equations, there's a couple things that are potentially wrong here. These rings are very, very thin, so it's going to require an enormous amount of energy to make the trick work. And then the other main problem is, is that the, uh, the warp bubble that would form as a result of these two rings would actually cut off the bridge. And so when they turned on the warp, it would cut the bridge off and they would float off and I guess the captain might be a little cross with that. Uh, so I worked with uh, Mark Rademacher and Mike Kuda from CBS Studios to come up with the IXS Enterprise concept as part of an education outreach. And so this little ship made it into a, a ship of the line calendar with a little educational blurb to encourage people to look into math, science, and art, and engineering. Uh, but you can see here the rings are considerably more athletic looking. They're saluting that optimization technique I highlighted to you guys. Uh, and then you can also see that the spacecraft fits within what would be the, the warp bubble of the spacecraft. And so uh, that was something fun that we got to do. And we've been able to use that uh, a number of times since. So um, I guess useful thoughts. Um, remember when you're going through life to establish your pinnacle objective, what is that? The uh, pinnacle objective is the, it's the objective that you use to filter all options that you have in life. Whenever you walk through different things, there's lots of things that try and uh, compete for your time. So Make sure you, and, and establish, a pinnacle objective may change depending upon what phase of life you're in. Uh, whenever you're doing communication in the form of emails or PowerPoint presentations or talking to people, be sure to establish the purpose of the email communication or the PowerPoint presentation and make sure you have at least straight in your head, what is your expected outcome? So purpose and expected outcome. Uh, be a value added team member when you, wherever you find yourself, uh, don't be somebody that uh, comes to the table with, no, we can't do this because of these eight things. Try and be somebody that comes to the table, yes, we might be able to do this if we do the following things. So try and be somebody that comes to the table with solutions instead of being somebody that always finds problems. Uh, you'll definitely find experiences where you work with both types of people and you'll kind of know which one you like. Uh, so try and be the, the yes if, if, if you can. And then finally, I'll finish with this, uh, selflessness. Uh, I think it's important to remember it, it's a team, right? I was chatting earlier with uh, the, the, the folks here at SSP. All right, there's all kinds of disciplines here tonight, right? There's uh, all, all different manner of people that are interested in all different things. 
And you know, when you when you talk about space exploration, it's it takes all these different disciplines working together to make these things possible. One of my good friends, Mike Gold, is a lawyer. Lawyer. Uh, he worked at NASA headquarters, and he penned the Artemis Accords. Uh, and so I could have never done that. That's not within my capacity to do that. But that was in his capacity as a lawyer to be able to write that uh, uh, that language up. And I think it'll have a big impact in the in the future. And so. Uh, this is uh, this domain is a system of systems, if you will, right? And so we need all the different disciplines. So that's part of what I like about uh, SSP. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take questions, can I take a selfie with everybody? I just want to take a. All right, we go. All right, three, two, one. Ah, one more. Three, two, one. Ah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, hi. Thank you for the very interesting lecture. Um, question Have you considered what would happen if a micrometeorite would impact a spaceship on 10C? Yeah, right. So, uh, <clears throat> Great question. I do get that a lot. Let's go back to the terrestrial example uh, that I was uh, I used to illustrate the idea of a space warp. When you're in the when you're in the airport uh, and you're walking at three miles an hour, right, and you step onto the belt, you're still moving at your initial state, three miles an hour, right. And so sometimes whenever you go to an airport, <clears throat> somebody has a kid that's trying to work off a lot of energy, and they'll go counterflow on those little travelators. Right, and occasionally, if you're going one, the, the right way and the kiddos are going the other way, and they're running down the, the middle of the travelator, they might smack your leg with their hand, right? Because they're, they're not paying attention to you. But that collision doesn't occur, right, at uh, some very high relative speed, if you will, because the kid is on the belt moving with you, even though he's he's closing with you. It's just like you walked into each other in normal space, right? Uh, so if you think about when uh, a, a warp bubble is moving through space and a piece of dust is just sitting there minding its own business. As the spacecraft comes along, the piece of dust gets picked up, it crosses the fenning region of the warp bubble, gets picked up into the warp bubble. The warp bubble speed drops as a result of this increase of mass to the system, but then it co-moves with the warp bubble. And then any interaction between the spacecraft and the piece of dust is whatever the initial velocity vector was of the warp vehicle before it turned on the bubble, right? So let's say you established an initial velocity vector of, of I don't know, 0.05 C, right? And so the collision would actually occur at 0.05 C in between the piece of dust and the spacecraft. But it will require to accelerate the piece of dust very, very quickly. Re repeat your statement. That means that the piece of dust is accelerated the moment it gets swollen by the bubble. The moment the piece of dust gets swollen by the warp bubble, so as, so as the, it has the, to accelerate immediately to 10C, like in a fraction so the, of a second. So the piece of dust, so because this is this is space time, this so you have to be careful about inertial frames, right? You, it's not like a billiard ball that's coming along and hits the piece of dust. There is a there's a frame of reference here where you've got curved space time, and so the piece of dust is minding its own business, and the space warp comes along, and the piece of dust sees the fenning region. It crosses the the region of of, of highest curvature. And it, get, it gets into the fenning region, into the bubble itself, that flat space time, right? And then at that point, the, the vo effective velocity of the spacecraft would decrease because of the addition of mass to the system. And so then the bubble would be moving. This, the, the, this piece of dust would cross the, fe cross the inside of the bubble at the unperturbed speed, exit the back, assuming it doesn't strike anything, exit the back of the warp bubble. And so the piece of dust would have moved. So the bubble did work on the, on the piece of dust. And so the bubble has to decrease velocity to account for that energy change. Now, if it hits the spacecraft, it's going to hit the spacecraft at whatever the uh, the velocity would be as if the warp bubble weren't even there, right? So imagine that the, uh, if the spacecraft never turned on the warp bubble and went through space and ran into that same piece of dust, it's it's the same situation. That's what that, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I'm trying to be, be careful about the inertial frames when you're moving from one to the other. No, what, what I meant is that the... If the dust enters the, the warp bubble, it has to accelerate on the outer re reference frame. <clears throat> so the, the bubble is not accelerating to 10C. The bubble is, is at a particular point in time. It goes to a very vast curvature, right, as, the, as this warp bubble comes along and moves through space-time. 
So we're moving space through space, right? And so the bubble goes through that that thinning region into the warp bubble, right? And so it's 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 and as a result, the 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 speed of the spacecraft has to go down to account for that change, right? So the only thing that the that the piece of dust is doing is it's moving through a a, a, a curved space time, if you will, right? And then moving out the back, and so it's moving from one location to the other. It's not accelerating to 10C. I surrender. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. I, I really, really enjoyed it, especially your last slide. Oh. <laughs> so uh, in, I'm just, my question is kind of in terms of logistics. I really want this to happen in real life. Uh, at the moment, we really only have uh, kind of a combination of the government and commercial yeah, funding. So I'm just curious: is there any um, is there any uh, critical steps, com commercial and government uh, combination, uh, you're excited for to actually improve this, or are you wishing for anything to happen so that that this could actually uh, speed up, or is it just a time that required in basically in research? That's it. <clears throat> but I, you know, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rephrase what you asked. Uh, maybe get 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 to it a different way. Uh, I you know I get asked a lot. When will we have warp drive? I I have no idea. Right? I couldn't even begin to tell you. Uh, all I can I mean we you heard me kind of highlight what we know about physics, and there's just a lot of stuff we we don't know. And I don't know if the idea of a space warp would ever actually be real, right? But I certainly know some things that I'm personally interested in working on, right? And I'm I'm working on those things, and they're very modest and and very slow. Uh, and I, I it, let me say this this way. Um, let me back up just a second. Uh, last year, I came to SSP 21, and it was in Strasbourg, and I got a chance to go see the Strasbourg Cathedral, right? And the Strasbourg Cathedral, I think it, they started building it in 1100, and they didn't finish building it until 1750. Uh, so the people that built the basement never could imagine what the final building might look like, right? But they knew they had to do their part for the next people to do their part. So. I think it's important to remember science, there's no shortcuts in science and it just may be a long game. I mean, I, I, I've got to do my part and maybe the next generation will have to do their part and maybe we'll get there one day, I don't know. Right? Uh, it'd be great if somebody were really clever and figured out how to do it, but uh, you know, there's, I, I, I think I'm doing maybe a poor job of answering your question. Um, I think you talked about resources. Uh, it'd be nice to see uh, the government uh, provide more basic research dollars uh, that might trace the things that fall into this category. Uh, you know, National Science Foundation does a lot of interesting things, but um, like NASA doesn't have a, a basic research category, like a 6.1, whereas DARPA Defense Science has 6.1. So I'd like to see more government agencies have uh, 6.1 basic research. Thank you very much. We have a question from online on YouTube, a question from Sarah Jane Lambert. Recently, the Cool Words Lab at Columbia University released a video asserting that an Alcubierre warp ship would produce paradoxes. Did you see it, and is there an answer to that hypothesis? Thank yeah, there, you. yeah, there's definitely a lot of concerns about uh, uh, the idea of a, of a space warp or their horizons. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's been discussed in literature associated with the idea of a space warp or a wormhole, uh, and so I think. Yeah, there's a lot more work to go do to see if that could ever be something that we could physically manifest because of some of those concerns. Uh, you know, but I go back to the fact that, um, you know, think of the Venn diagram I highlighted, right? Quantum mechanics and, and general relativity, right? These are two models that we know very, very well, but they only touch at a single tangent point. And we find ourselves in a situation where we have things like dark energy and dark matter, where most of the universe, we don't even know what it's made of. And so in the process of trying to get to the next level of understanding beyond just quantum mechanics and general relativity, maybe we'll be better positioned to try to address some of those concerns that seem uh, paradoxical or, or confusing within the limits of what we know of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Hello. Um, we have sort of established that any collision with space debris could be at low speeds. And from what I understood, we could be traveling if we have warp drives like any arbitrary speed like 10C, 100C. My question is, would we be able to see, let's say see, 
like a large object that we're going to like <laughs> run into. And yeah, yeah. the second question is, yeah. um, have you looked into the research of small modular reactors? I think there's uh, work being done in that, like for, for power and earth applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, so your, your question, I, th I think, has some proximity to the question of the gentleman behind you as well, right? Uh, navigating and trying to avoid hitting something, right? That's, certainly, that's the best way to, to not hit something is to know it's there and, and avoid it. Um, you know, I, th that's a good question, right? Uh, uh, you know, you'll be able to see photons coming in from the front of the spacecraft, but, uh, the, you know, how would you deal with the fact that uh, the amount of time frame you might have to respond? I don't know. Those are... Those are all, those are great questions, but I find those tend to be, those are very much in the operational side of things. And I think I've got like, you know, 9,999 other problems I need to, 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 to deal with just from a conceptual perspective, right? I've, I've heard other people talk about that and that is a good question. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure somebody would figure it out if we had to, to go try and figure that out. So, uh, and then you said small modular reactors. Uh, yes. So, um, there is some work going on on small modular reactors. And when you say small modular reactors, I'm assuming you're speaking to the 100 megawatt uh, type of power level uh, that companies like Dex Energy, New Scale, and a couple others that are working on. And I think there's some initiatives uh, going on right now to try and uh, bring those to bear and actually provide power for the grid. Uh, the Department of Defense category, that 1 to 10 megawatt electric is called a micro reactor. Uh, and so that's interesting to, to follow that. That's certainly, in my mind, a little bit uh, closer to something that I can envision how we might repackage and put on top of a, a rocket at some point in time. Uh, the small modular reactors are, are still pretty big. Those things are like, you know, you got wide load trucks carrying those things. So, Hi. Um, again, really enjoyed your lecture. Um, I was there for the pilot wave theory class. So I think yeah. a lot of the information um, seemed familiar. I uh, wanted to ask a question on these um, milli G's and the heliocentric, yeah. the milli G slide yeah. and the heliocentric travel. I think there's yeah. a lot of confusion as to why that number is significant and how that is better than, um, you know, significantly larger thrust values. Right. So th this has to do with uh, persistent thrust, right? So if you have a, a chemical rocket, it just does a, it just does a, 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 a impulsive, uh, thrust that's a very small period of time and then a spacecraft moves through whatever the resultant trajectory is as it moves to whatever destination it's trying to go through. But if you have low thrust, you have a system that's pushing 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for potentially months on end. And so when you're in this low thrust regime, right, and you can exceed 0.6 milligees and you can, you can push at 0.6 milligees for hours, weeks, months, years, Right, you end up with trajectories that can potentially be radial uh, in the solar system, if you will. Right, a, chemi a chemical propulsion can't push that long. Yes, it can be really high. Right, you might have three Gs or five Gs for a chemical propulsion system, but it's it's like that. Right, it it it, it doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on being able to cross the uh, the the gravity gradient lines, if you will, uh, climbing out of the solar system's uh, uh, gravitational potential. Well, that help. Um, I have one more question. Um, <laughs> I remember you mentioning solitons in your um, pilot wave theory. Yeah. Does the warp bubble act like a soliton? Um, and if so, are there any possibilities where you don't need negative energy? I believe there was a, a, a couple of papers that came out, one by a guy by the name of uh, Lentz, uh, and then I think there's another one with two authors. I can't remember what it is. They purport that uh, they have models that only require positive energy density to make the idea of a space warp work. But there's actually some division in the community as to whether that is that is completely accurate. And the point, in fact, that they uh, there's I think some folks have done some work to show that they still will need uh, uh, exotic matter to make those solutions work. But that that work hasn't been published yet that I'm aware of. So. Okay. And we have another question from YouTube from Kabid Zaman. Are those Casimir cavities microscale or nanoscale? What will be the change when we scale it up? Thank you. 
what will be the scale when you scale it up or scale it? Yeah, the, what will be the change when we scale it up? Oh, okay. I, I think I know what they mean. They don't mean physically make it bigger. They mean add a whole bunch of them. Uh, let me just speak to the, this. So the Casimir cavities that you saw, the scanning electron microscopes, those are in microns. Those gaps are microns. The smallest we've been able to achieve is seven micron gap. Um, uh, we'd like to be able to get into the nanometer level because it scales nonlinearly uh, as a function of the gap, uh, but that requires some new approaches. We're looking at those right now. Uh, we're hoping to maybe get a chance to make some of those in the next uh, six, eight months where we can get down to the uh, maybe 50 nanometers or 100 nanometers uh, in terms of the, the separation distance. But you're, you're really, you're on the leading edge of, already we're on the leading edge, so we're, we're, it's, a, it's a struggle. So in, in terms of scaling up, I assume you mean like in an integrated device. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a crawl, walk, run kind of guy. So I, I think just right now, we'll, we just want to see if we can't make the devices and test them in the lab and see if we can see consistency uh, and uh, correlation with the physics models first. So. so, Sonny, I think we are at the end of our time. I'm sure there are lots of other questions. But after this event, we are actually hosting a reception. So I'm okay. sure there will be more questions okay. there. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much for this very wonderful talk. Thank you. All right, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are closing today this event. Next week, on the same day at the same time, next Tuesday, the 2nd of August, uh, at the same time at 8.30 p.m. Portuguese time, we will be running our last, very last distinguished lecture of the summer. So as actually we discussed uh, earlier today, uh, Pete Warden, one of our ISU faculty members, will be here. And actually, uh, several times it was touched during today's presentation. So Pete will be actually discussing one of the applications which we discussed the physics this evening. Uh, so he'll be looking into actually how we can reach on the engineering side to Alpha Centauri system and look at the, the habitable zones there and particularly one uh, 